Hello, Dr. Eugene Aiello here at Aiello Family Chiropractic. Thank you for viewing another one of my video series on patient education. Um, today's topic is going to deal with what our first video spoke about, um, the muscle imbalance that I'm treating. So um, the thalamocortical dysrhythmia, as I was discussing earlier, that functional neuro neurologic approach to chiropractic where what I'm doing is evaluating which side of the body is exhibiting a postural muscle balance and tone imbalance. The goal of my treatment would be using spinal manipulations to activate that thalamus, to, to treat the thalamocortical dysrhythmia by afferent input from spinal proprioceptive joints, in addition to using lasers, cold lasers, to stimulate sensory nerves to also activate that thalamus on the level of the quantum system within our body. Um, we'll be discussing in time what the quantum system is. If you're interested, I also have a video playlist on my YouTube channel that's the Introduction to Biophotonics. It explains the concepts that are in my book, The Conscious Canary. Um, this series, I'm trying to stay simple and just basic so people understand what they were uh, learning the first or second visit they were with me. So if you remember the, the dysrhythmia, the functional neurologic issue that I'm correcting, is a muscle imbalance to posture tone on one side of the body. T6, midsection up, muscles in the front of the body take on a higher tone. Muscles in the back of the body start firing less, they get weaker. Lower body muscles in the front are the ones that get a little weaker, the muscles in back are what get tighter. So what I'm looking at with a patient is a basic postural alignment that occurs as a result of this muscle imbalance. So the muscle imbalance in the lower extremity, that tightness in back, weakness in front, is gonna cause the one pelvis to rotate out of position backwards. When that happens, it's actually shortening that leg. It's not really shortening it, it's just the position of the acetabulum, your hip joint is more forward now, so that leg has further to travel. So we exhibit a short leg, which causes a compensation within the sacrum, the sacrum, the bone in the middle between the two iliums, has to go through a tip and an actual rotation where the front of that sacrum is gonna rotate forward. The other pelvis is gonna compensate by rotating in an anterior direction. So the main thing I see a lot in my office is strained SI joints. When this is out of alignment and you're walking around doing your daily activities and you bend over to pick up a pencil and move the wrong way, that misalignment will put strain into that joint. Once that joint gets inflamed, people are presenting to my office with pain. The spine is resting on the sacrum. So when that sacrum goes through its tip and its rotation, the vertebrae are each gonna be compensating for that. So when people go to a subluxation-based chiropractor and they get an X-ray of their spine and they're saying, oh, your T6 over here is rotated, we're gonna to have to adjust it into place. As I st stated in my last video, there's never been proof that if you focus in just one vertebra with a manipulation, you can never align it. Proper chiropractic care, aligning this pelvis, will make those subluxations, those compensations disappear. So as we move up, when we have this imbalance, our scapulas actually go through rotation. So that tightness in the front is gonna start pulling that scapula more rounded. It's gonna rotate it too. So we're gonna get a scapular rotation on this side and on the other side, a compensatory rotation. Obviously, this is going to create a lot of issues with our rotator cuff because we're attaching our humerus bone into that scapula. When that scapula rotates into the different positions, it's putting strains on those rotator cuff tendons. Bicipital tendonitis, a very common thing I see here, when that shoulder's rotated, that bicipital tendon is now in a different location, and overactivity will put stress on that tendon, creating a tendonitis. The shoulders will also compensate and will have a high shoulder. The interesting part is there's no rhyme or reason to this. A short left leg could have a high left shoulder. A short left leg could have a low left shoulder. It's all a matter of how you're compensating with those muscles and everybody does it differently. So I don't go off of that as being an indicator of how someone's misaligned in their pelvis. So that tipping of the shoulder is gonna put a lot of strain into that trap muscle. Next most important thing or most common thing I see in my office, patients presenting with that neck and upper trap trigger point. So all, all starting from this pelvis misaligned from that muscle imbalance. In the neck, you're gonna get spinal corrections, not as much as you're gonna get in the thoracic and lumbar, but there will be a little bit of curvature in there trying to right itself. What I mean by that 
is everything has to orient in such a way that the head is straight. We're not going to be walking around with our head tipped unless there's some major spinal issues, ma major muscular issues that are pulling it. So you're going to get spinal corrections. You're going to end up getting strain in these suboccipital muscles at the base of the skull because those guys are trying to hold that head in that perfect straight position. So one side is going to get a lot of tension. Another common thing people present with is that knot at the suboccipital is causing tension headaches. So this is the basic, how should I say, anatomic derangement of the body that I'm looking at. And when I evaluate a patient, that's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to find out where those muscles are out of tone, where the muscles are weak, what are the positions of the scapulas in the pelvis. That's going to dictate how I'm going to treat the patient. When we have these spinal compensations that I keep mentioning, the entire spinal muscular system is off, meaning certain muscles are going to be contracting more, certain are going to be contracting less. So when you're on your feet or you're at a desk at a computer and you're in these postures, those muscles are going to fatigue a lot faster than they should. So different paraspinal musculature issues, which again goes along with the neck, that upper trap issue. It's commonly the back of the neck muscles and the upper trap irritated. So when these extremity muscles, and when I talked about the imbalance anterior to posterior with the T6 division point, it's actually the extremity muscles that this is happening in. This muscle imbalance I'm talking about does not have anything to do with the spinal musculature. That's a completely separate system from your peripheral skeleton. So the peripheral skeleton is where this is actually occurring. So the weak muscles, so the muscles in the back and the upper body, the muscles in the front and the lower body, they're going to fatigue quicker. They're going to get trigger points. Those are those painful knots that we need to massage out. More importantly, something that patients don't understand. A lot of times I get people that come in and say, do you work on knees? Of course I work on knees. When you have this muscle imbalance in the anterior muscles of your leg, the front of your thigh, those are all your stabilizing muscles for your hip and knee. So when these weak muscles aren't firing like they're supposed to be, you're going to have instability of the hip, the knee, and even the ankle. Same thing in the upper body, but we don't bear weight in it often. You're going to have instability in your shoulder and elbow with this too. Weakening of tendons, prone to exertional tearing. So when you have less tone on a muscle, the, the, the constant pull on those tendons is less than it should be. So those tendons actually get weaker. So the most common is tennis elbow. Weakness of that extensor muscle from this postural tone will weaken that extensor tendon up here. When you go to use it, you do something you're not used to doing and you do an ex a straining activity, that tendon starts to tear and then you end up with a chronic inflammatory condition. So tennis elbow is something we work with common. Rotator cuff is in that same category. Um, I, on occasion, we'll see that in the patellar tendon. If that patella is getting weaker and someone decides they're going to go play basketball and jump, I'll see that in the ankle. We get a lot of ankle instability from people not being active and becoming active and not having that stability of the tendon and the muscle. So weakened muscles create their own set of symptoms. The tight muscles, obviously spasms. So those muscles in the back of the leg, the calf, the hamstring, the glute, the low back muscles, those guys are already going to be at a little bit of a hypertonic state. When you go to use them, if you excessively use them, they're going to go into spasms. Nerve entrapment. Another very common thing I'm seeing. Unfortunately, with the design of our body, our major nerves usually are going through the muscles that have the tendency to be hypertonic. So if those muscles get very tight, as nerves have to pass through them, they get compressed. So I see that in the scalene muscles up in here in the neck. I see it under in the pec minor causing thoracic outlet. I see it in the forearm and the pronator. So a lot of times when people have a carpal tunnel or they think they have a disc herniation, it's actually tight muscles compressing those nerves. So correcting that muscle imbalance and basically flossing that nerve, breaking adhesions through is going to be the correction, not a surgery and not an epidural injection. Chronic tendonitis. So versus weak muscles where the tendons get weak from not being used and then you do an exertional activity and you irritate it, when you have chronic tension in those muscles, that tendon is constantly under tension. Achilles tendonitis would be the big one there. Plantar fasciitis, same thing, that calf being tight, pulling that plantar fascia. Um, on rare events, I'll see hamstring insertion. So up in the trochanter, the hamstring gets a, uh, gets a tendonitis. Um, golfer's elbow. So tight muscles in the front here, that chronic tension at the attachment site of the flexor muscles will end up with tennis elbow. Um, 
there's other weird ones that, that, that don't come up that often. So when I'm evaluating a patient and they're explaining their symptoms to me, in my mind, I'm looking at this area as being the, the cause. And then I'm looking at their body to see if that side of the body that they're having their complaint on matches up with the muscle imbalance. Usually it does. Every once in a while, I'll run into people where the other side is off, which I have to correct. And then the, the, the side of the complaint will usually present. So in a nutshell, it's actually quite simplistic what we do at this office. Um, that pattern, like I told you, when I learned it from the neurologist I was working for, that thalamocortical dysrhythmia pattern, that aberrant firing from thalamus to cortex, there's all kinds of circuitry up in the cortex that other doctors are looking at. Like I said, different functional disorders, um, spectrum, ADHD, obsessive compulsive things, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. But for me, the most important thing is when I learned about this muscle imbalance. From an orthopedic standpoint, it pretty much explains most things. Um, I do run into people who have traumatic issues. Even trauma, a lot of times, will be associated with this because of the instability of the joints. So if you're off on your right side and you're out of balance and you're playing basketball, that right ankle is more likely to turn. Um, if you're training for a marathon and that right side's off, you're going to be more likely to be getting Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis. So making this neurologic correction is the very first step in getting this person, any patient, back in order. Um, there's more modalities I use. Usually this type of treatment to fix the functional imbalances of muscles is pretty rapid. It shouldn't take me more than four to six adjustments. Um, during that time, I'll be using the cold laser, which usually that even fixes quicker. After that, usually soft tissue massage is what I'm going to be doing from that point forward, breaking up these trigger points, breaking up any of these tendonitis scar tissue within the tendons. Um, I do have in my toolbox, if people are not responding to the deep tissue mas massage, we could use uh, dry needling techniques too. Um, those are going to help get uh, healing going and circulation. Um, if you read a little bit, I have a blog article on my website where I really detail what I think dry needling is doing um, outside the scope of this simple video I want to make today, but quite amazing results with it. Um, the only reason I don't choose to go to it right away, it involves needles, it involves time, it involves more money for your treatments. So I like to try and stick to the basic routine of a a regular chiropractic treatment where I do many amounts of soft tissue, get everything in balance, and usually that corrects most patients. So the next topic I wanted to discuss is uh, why do these things happen? Why? What can you do to prevent it? So I'm going to take a minute, I'm going to erase this board, and I'm going to uh, pick up where I left off. So why do spinal joints get restricted in the first place? So as I spoke before in the first video, that restriction of the vertebra is decreasing sensory input to that thalamus and that decreased input, that deafferentation, that loop is weakening thalamocortical firing. So why do these joints restrict? Um, trauma, obviously. If you were in a whiplash injury and you injured the spinal joint, those little muscles between the vertebrae are gonna restrict that joint to protect it. Lots of times that restriction stays, meaning the body just doesn't relax after. So that, that is probably my least <laughs> likely reason I see people. Um, most likely stress. When I say stress, I mean mental and physical. Um, chronic tension. Being under stress, you're going to tighten all your muscles up around your spine. Um, I call it the turtling reflex. When people are anxious, they slump their head forward, they roll their shoulders, and they tighten up everything in their neck. Um, believe it or not, some people will do that even in their back muscles. When people are stressed, they'll tighten their back and even their pelvic floor. Um, there's other people who their jaw and grit their teeth and they start creating TMJ issues. Um, mental stress is um, probably the hardest thing that I work with here. We're going to discuss how to uh, try to resolve that. Physical. My spelling isn't so good here, is it? Physical stress. What I mean by physical stress. Um, Poor posture at work. If you're sitting at a computer and you're chronically using certain muscles and you're in a certain posture for prolonged times. Physical labor, some people that are having jobs where they physically overstress themselves, that can cause joint restriction too. And always think of this as compression. Muscles are just squeezing and they're compressing those spinal joints, not allowing them to move. Viscerosomatic, more common than people think. What a viscerosomatic reflex is, is when your viscera, an internal organ, 
is under distress. If it's under distress, it's going to be sending nerve input to the spinal column and it's going to go into a level that is shared by muscles, by a nerve that's a peripheral nerve. Um, that vertebra is going to get irritated along with it, meaning the little muscles are going to contract there and they're going to hold that guy restricted. Um, heart attacks, people hear with a heart attack, left arm, jaw. The reason for that is the heart is going into the same nerve levels in the spine as those sensory dermatones. Um, when someone's going to have a heart attack, they're obviously in their upper thoracic, lower cervical spine, they're going to have restrictions. Um, another one I see that's common is when people have a stomach ulcer. They'll come in with extreme pain in their mid-back and they think they've got a vertebra out or a rib out or something. And when I get back there and feel it, and I see how sensitive they are. I'll ask them, is your stomach been, oh yeah, I've been eating a lot of antacids. So that's common. The other one is a lot of low back pain patients are having trouble with their GI tract, especially their colon. They're going to either constipated, they're gassy, they're just, just irritated in their large intestine. Well, that large intestine refers into the L4, L5 area. So people come in with their back hurting and their muscles in their back completely locked up. And uh, I'll right away start asking the questions. Most people deny it until they're not improving with my regular treatment. And that's a clue to me that something else is going on. A visceral issue is causing those restrictions to keep coming back. Inactivity, do I even need to say anything? <laughs> Your spine, it, it, it's a unit that moves. If you're not moving, that's going to start freezing up, meaning it's going to stiffen. So I think it was... Uh, I can't remember his first name, the Pilates guy. I guess his, his big theory is that if you don't have flexibility of the spine, you start to move like an older person. So young people have spinal flexibility and part of the aim of Pilates is to keep that spinal rotation, spinal flexion extension. If you have that, you're gonna move like a young person. So inactivity, just not using your spine. Then we move on to the other topic, which it's more confusing for my patients. Um, like I said, I wrote a book on this topic and I have videos on it. If you're interested, read it. But I believe we don't just have our basic afferent binary nervous system affecting the thalamus. I believe that your thalamus is receive, receiving energy, quantum energy from the pigment systems. That quantum input is what drives the quantum system of our nervous system. That quantum system is the complex nervous system. That's dealing with every function of every cell in your body, uniting you as one and coordinating what happens in this binary system. So it's the master system. But what causes this system to go off balance? EMFs and RFs, electromagnetic pollution. We're surrounded by it constantly. These these are having an effect on that quantum input in the system. So when I'm using cold lasers, that's what I'm working with. I'm using a laser as trying to offset how your frequencies have been shifted. Um, what do you do about it? Don't spend any money. EMF blocking, clothing, those stickers on phones, the things you could put in your house, nothing can block EMF radiation. Um, when I get through with this little section, I'm going to do a quick demonstration on how you can effectively block electromagnetic energy, which is completely impractical, meaning you can't do it. So let's just hope that what I've been working on with the lasers can offset these frequencies. The only thing that stinks about it, it's a dynamic environment, meaning I can fix you today on what's around us but they're constantly launching new satellites with different frequencies. They're constantly creating new frequencies in cell towers. Um, the electromagnetic environment would uh, make your head spin if you could actually see these electromagnetic waves. We're living in a, a strobe light of it, basically. There's constant bombardment on and off and constant additions to it, which is affecting public health. And uh, I, I really think you should watch the video series if you are interested in the topic. I'm not going to touch on too much of it in this series, but how do you offset this? If you're not getting enough sunlight, you're going to be way more susceptible to this, meaning that quantum system is driven by light, sunlight, natural light. Um, in the wintertime, when we get less light, we're going to be more susceptible. That's why people are sicker, they're tired, they're depressed. That quantum system is completely off tune. So sunlight, um, next best would be red light therapy, but again, as you're going to find in this video series, I don't like anything that's artificial. You want to stick to what Mother Nature provides, sunlight. Um, in addition, the sunlight grounding. So it's not a bad idea to get outside and get your feet on the dirt. 
Um, I don't think that grounding is directly linked to the quantum system, but the electromagnetic nature of our body could be out of harmony in that way, and grounding might help a little bit with EMF problems. So one of the things that helps this is when I was talking about getting some physical activity, well, actually I didn't talk about that yet, but physical activity is gonna be a topic we're gonna to discuss in a little bit. Preferably do this physical activity in sunlight. Preferably do some physical activity outside with your shoes off, combine it, be more natural. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be outside all day, walking around, doing physical activity, getting sunlight. We're not supposed to be under these fluorescent bulbs in an office with a computer beaming blue light and electromagnetic fields at us all day. Of course, you're going to feel sick. Of course, your quantum system is going to be off. So I'm going to take a little break here because I'm going to set up a little experiment I want to show you in relation to this blocking of EMFs. I don't like to hear when my patients tell me they spent money on something that's just completely useless. Um, yeah, tinfoil hats don't work either. So, but anyway, uh, we'll be right back. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that experiment. We're gonna make a separate video for that, just a mini video. Um, the reason is after I was setting it up, I realized I needed my phone for it and I can't film and do the experiment at the same time. So I'm gonna need somebody else's phone. So I'm gonna continue on. So with everything we talked about, what's the first step for correction? So when someone's in this state, they're out of balance, we're gonna go through spinal manipulation, cold laser treatment, as I discussed earlier. We're gonna get everything in balance. During that process of treatment, we're also going to start with some soft tissue massage. Just simple, basic. Don't take your clothes off. We do it in the office after the adjustment. I'm going to instruct you on home stretching. The reason we're going to instruct you on home stretching, we're hitting two components here. Soft tissue is going to be addressing those trigger points. We're going to try and break those up. We're going to use soft tissue to break up any adhesions, adhesions within tendonitis. Home stretching, we're going to be doing that because of the tight muscles. So those muscles that are in the the spastic state, we're going to want to start lengthening those as soon as we can. That's usually a four to six, four to six visit time frame. It doesn't take too long to make the correction of the postural imbalance. Anything else that's left over within the soft tissue, we'll be working on deep tissue massage and possibly dry needling at that point. Um, I have patients that I have to see them up to 10 to 15 visits in addition to the four to six if they're really chronic. If they're terrible and it's been going on for a long time, it takes time to actually break up all those trigger points, adhesions, and to get those muscles flexible again. So when we're done with my care, aftercare. Aftercare, the first step is stress modification. There's a very simple step I tell every patient, 15 minute time. What I mean by that is for 15 minutes, you're gonna go in a dark room. You're gonna go away from all the noise. You're gonna lay on your back on the hard floor and just think, don't think, Whatever happens, just lay there for 15 minutes. Most of the time you're gonna fall asleep and extend it to 20 minutes. You're not gonna, if you're on the hard floor, you're not gonna turn into a full blown two, three hour nap. So it's one of those things that most people realize it's 15 to 20 minutes. Sometimes they snooze for five, you wake up feeling completely invigorated. Reset that mental mind. You wanna get yourself all these stresses out. The only way you're gonna do that is quiet time by yourself. Cardio. Cardiovascular exercise, probably the best stress reducer there is. Um, weightlifting is not gonna have the same effect. During weightlifting, you're actually getting that sympathetic fight or flight nervous system activated, and you're gonna finish that weightlifting, weightlifting session feeling more tense. Um, some people, they find it relaxing. It, it can be if it's something you do, it burns off steam. It's not that I'm saying don't lift weights, but cardiovascular, 30 to 60 minutes. Why is that important? What did I say was the biggest input to the brain? Joint movement, proprioception. When you do 30 to 60 minutes of cardiovascular exercise, you're actually stimulating that posture tone to be what it should. So if you are having minor issues after your adjustments that maybe you're not holding completely, cardiovascular exercise is gonna help that posture. Yoga and stretching, huge. When I was younger, I never stretched until I got into my 40s and I started having tendonitis and different issues and started realizing that that stretching is a huge component. I'll spend about 15, 20 minutes a day stretching. In addition, and I don't do my 60 of cardio, I usually get about 30 minutes of cardio and I put 15 to 20 minutes of stretching in. If I have extra time, I'll do a little bit of weight training, but I don't do it as often just because my schedule is so busy. Diet, huge. Remember we were talking visceral somatic reflex earlier? 
you want that diet clean. And when I mean clean, you want to be eating real foods. You want to be eating chicken. You want to be eating beef. You want to be eating fish. You don't want things that are processed. You don't want things that are packaged. You want to eat fruits. You want to eat vegetables. You want to try and eat organic. You don't want junk food. When it comes to your meats, you want to try and eat wild caught fish, grass fed beef, free range chickens, you know, things that are not GMO modified. They're not fed all these different chemicals because you're going to consume that when you eat it. Water, at least 64 ounces a day. If you're a coffee drinker, you want to have more water. They say that 12 ounces of coffee, you got to add that to your 64. You need to have water. When I was talking about intestines and back pain, most of my back pain patients are having intestinal issues because they're dehydrated. That colon is sucking the fluid out of your feces, out of that leftover material. If you're dehydrated, that's not going to move through and you're going to have constipation issues. So water is huge. Probiotics. Bringing up probiotics reminded me of something that I skipped. When I say clean diet, that includes you don't want anything synthetic. You don't want to take synthetic vitamins. You don't want to be taking pharmaceuticals. You don't want to be taking anything that's man-made. So probiotics that you buy in a little capsule, those things are lab-grown probiotics. Those are genetically modified most of the time. You want natural probiotics. You can get natural probiotics from live culture sauerkraut, live culture kimchi. There's all kinds of live culture type of fermented foods. If you go to Whole Foods, there's a whole area. You also want to get live culture in your, your, your dairy products. Uh, kefir, live culture cottage cheese, um, yogurts, things of, the, of that nature. You want to keep a probiotic flow into your body constantly. You don't want to be doing it through pills. Um, if you smoke, going back to the clean, you want to stop smoking. If you drink, moderate drinking. You only want to have one or two drinks a day. You're extending that up to a bottle of wine every night. You're destroying yourself. Your body is getting toxic from that. The whole idea of clean eating is not to put toxins into your system. So you should look at labels. Um, I teach my youngest daughter because she always wants cereal. And I, I tell her, I'm like, well, I want you to read that cereal box. And if you don't understand every ingredient that's in there, you probably shouldn't be consuming it. Um, there's a nutritionist um, that I really enjoy. His name's Jay Gulinello. Um, PerpetualHealth.com has quite a, quite a vast amount of information. Um, his one saying is, if man has modified it, you have to question it. It has to be suspicious, meaning you should never trust anything man-made. So aftercare is basically taking care of yourself. You want to keep yourself in good shape. You want to keep yourself de-stressed. You want to keep yourself fed with good foods. So that concludes what I wanted to talk about here. Um, I look forward to our next video. Don't know the topic yet, but I'm going to throw together that short video of uh, my EMF blocking uh, demonstration, showing people that uh, the only way you're going to block EMFs is something you're not going to want to do. So um, hopefully I get that done pretty quick. But anyway, thank you.